Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> that was much too kind and elaborate an introduction, but I'm very flattered. Um, it's a huge privilege and pleasure for me to be chairing this lecture. Professor Maurice Cremona is an old friend, um, old in the sense of long standing. <laughs> and Other senses a, too. And a, an admired colleague. Just not very long ago, external relations law was seen as quite an arcane corner of um, EU law. But Marita's early work helped to bring it into the mainstream uh, so that scholars realized that it was an area not only of great intrinsic interest, but one where fundamental issues of EU law often arose. Professor Cremona was a, a professor at, at Queen Mary. She's currently a professor at the European Uni Uni University Institute in Florence. And I should mention that in addition to her outstanding scholarly reputation, she was invited to become acting president of the EUI during an interregnum, which was a quite extraordinary vote of confidence by her colleagues at a difficult moment for the, for the Institute. So it's with keen anticipation that I invite <laughs> Professor Cremona to address us on structural principles in EU external relations law. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Kimberley and, uh, and the organizers and to UCL for, for inviting me. Um, so, uh, I'm talking about structural principles and their role in EU external relations law. My starting point is an observation which is based on earlier work that I did on the Court of Justice and EU external relations objectives. And this is that in the external policy field, the court has not been a driving force behind the EU's policy agenda in the same way that the creation of the single market has influenced its approach to interpreting and enforcing substantive treaty provisions on discrimination or competition policy or free movement, or the way in which it shaped the concept of union citizenship, for example. This might be the re result of reluctance on the part of the court to engage with external political choices. But my purpose here is not to look for what might motivate the court, it's rather to address this phenomenon by explo exploring what role law plays in EU external relations or EU external action and whether and to what extent law may operate differently in the external from the internal context. The nature of the treaty provisions on EU external action with a set of open-ended policy objectives and fewer policy-directed legal obligations on the member states has left much to the agenda setting of the political institutions. And this seems natural. Surely it's in the nature of foreign relations to be politics driven and for law to play a minor role. But in fact, law does play an important role in EU external relations. The court has had no hesitation in establishing principles and far reaching rules governing the scope of union external competence, institutional questions, concerning the exercise of that competence and the consequent obligation on the member states, both of com compliance and cooperation. For example, its insistence that legal basis is a matter of constitutional significance and subject to judicial control. Its insistence on the importance of judicial review and the priority of EU primary law. Its development of the doctrines of exclusivity and preemption its development of the duty of cooperation, now based on Article 4.3 TEU, requiring the Member States to exercise their own powers in ways which are compatible with union law, 
which don't hinder the Union's exercise of its competencies and which do not jeopardise the unity of international representation of the Union. So what explains this contrast between its attitude towards substantive policy and its attitude towards this institutional relations? And how can we characterise the role that law plays in EU external relations? The treaties set broadly defined policy objectives or orientations, we might say almost, for EU external action. But they don't establish any end point or goal to which they seek to move the Union. The Union instead is given a task, the task of developing relations and building partnerships with third countries and international, regional or global organisations. It's given a number of policy fields in which to operate. It's given a range of instruments, a set of orientating, open-ended and non-prioritised objectives. Against this background, the direction and goals of EU external policy must be set by the institutions themselves. And the court is very rarely driven to find that the Union's external powers are being misused, emphasising instead the need for the political institutions to retain their discretion, their room for manoeuvre. It is, on the whole, non-interventionist. It takes those choices at face value, basing itself on statements and legal instruments and policy documents. It doesn't question them or seek to define or shape them. Instead, it's taken on another role. It ensures that the institutions act within their powers, that the member states do not obstruct the formation and implementation of union policy. It is, in fact, I would say, engaged in establishing and protecting an institutional space within which policy may be formed, in which the different actors understand and work within their respective roles. And the principles which have been drawn from the treaties and elaborated by the court to establish this institutional space, I call structural principles. They include the duty of sincere cooperation, the principles of conferral and institutional balance, mutual solidarity, subsidiarity and the principle of autonomy. What I want to do today is to explore a bit further the nature and the interrelationships of these structural principles as legal norms. The, and the first, um, the starting point really is to uh, exp is to look at the way in which um, EU external competences have been drafted in the treaty and the response of the court to that, that um, characteristic of external competences. The original Treaty of Rome contained only two express external powers, the common commercial policy and a provision on association agreements. These original provisions set no specific goals. They gave the community a field of activity in which to exercise its competence, but without specifying the purposes of this action. The common commercial policy, it's true, did mandate the establishment of a policy based on uniform principles, but it was the uniformity that was important, the alignment of the different member states' trade policies and not the content of the common rules. Association agreements were simply described as involving reciprocal rights and obligations, common action and special procedures. And indeed, we can see that these original external powers have been used for a very wide variety of purposes, from establishing uh, the WTO to development-oriented selective trade preferences, from pre-accession to integration without accession, from preferential status for former colonies to free trade agreements with strategic trading partners. The EU's most more recent express external powers, such as development cooperation or the common foreign security policy, share this open-ended character, their competences to engage in a particular policy field. What of the external powers which are, are not explicit in the treaty, but which are based on policy fields which uh, don't mention external action, but where this is deemed necessary in order to achieve the treaty's policy objectives. This latter category of implied external powers introduced by the AETR case law and now codified into Article 216 uh, TFEU is indeed tied to objectives, but these are internal objectives. 
They're the objectives of the internal power on which the implied external power is based. And the link to internal objectives may indeed limit the scope of the external powers to which they're linked. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of um, the court's judgment in opinion uh, 194 on the WTO, where it held that the um, internal policy fields of freedom of establishment and freedom to provide services did not necessarily require the union to enter into ex external agreements with third countries. Um, more recently, some internal powers from which external powers might be implied are themselves defined in a, a, an open-ended way without specifying end goals. I'm thinking, for example, of the provisions on com a common immigration policy, which in a way in its structure has more in common with the common commercial policy, in other words, an emphasis on the, on the management of migration, of establishing uniformity at external borders rather than uh, being closer to the internal provisions on free movement of persons. So my argument so far is that external powers characteristically do not es establish a, a policy goals, but rather a field of action in which the EU can operate. And the court has not created a role for the law or a role for itself in determining the use made of those powers. Um, if we look briefly at uh, four key areas um, of external relations policy competences, we can see uh, a little bit, in a little bit more detail how that works. So I want to look at trade and association agreements, the CFSP and development cooperation, but I'll, I'll do that rather, rather briefly. So I've already, as I've already said, the original Treaty of Rome focused on the need for a, a uniform trade policy rather than saying anything about the policy content. And um, even now, the, the, the case law of the court post-Lisbon um, on the scope of the common commercial policy confirms this more, this traditional, you might say, approach to trade. The, the, the approach of the court is functionalist. A measure will fall within the common commercial policy if it is essentially intended, the court says, to promote, facilitate or govern trade and has a direct and immediate effects on trade. So the policy content of the measure is not really relevant to the court. It's the effects of the measure. It may be a measure which regulates or restricts trade as well as a measure which, libera which liberalizes. I don't think the common commercial policy is likely to see what you might call a tobacco advertising moment, in other words. Um, in one case, um, Back in, uh, back in 90, 1994, um, UK against council, one of the many UK against council cases, um, the court, the, this was a case where achieving uniform rules had been preferred over liberalisation. And the court said the objective of contributing to the progressive abolition of restrictions on international trade cannot compel the institutions to liberalise imports from non-member countries where to do so would be contrary to the interests of the community. Um, in addition to this functional dimension of the trade competence, um, I think one could also point to the way in which uh, trade instruments have always been used um, from the beginning, really, to achieve any number of different further policy objectives, whether it be development, environmental protection, security of supply of strategic materials, granting or withholding political approval, promotion of human rights. So trade policy has always been instrumentalized by the union. Um, association agreements. Here we see the court accepting a very wide range of purposes to which they've been put and indeed, and this is what I want to emphasize, insisting that their interpretation must be guided by those purposes. So in its interpretation of the Europe agreements with the countries of Central and Eastern Europe that would eventually become member states, the court recognized the aim of the association agreements of progressively integrating those countries into the community as it was, um, and offered this as a reason for extending its case law on non-discrimination in relation to conditions of employment. Um, 
just as one example, despite the fact that the agreements did not contain as a specific objective the free movement of workers. Um, in another example, the degree of integration envisaged in the European Economic Area Agreement has led the court to espouse an, an internal legal base for the adoption of decisions to adapt EEA, the EEA a key. In contrast, when interpreting the provisions on services in the association agreement with Turkey, the court in the Demokan case contrasted the purely economic aims of that agreement with those of the EU treaties in refusing to apply its case law on recipients of services. So these are examples of the court's willingness to accept the specific degrees of integration apparently intended by the parties to these different association agreements, despite the fact they're concluded under the same legal basis. It has never tried to extract from the treaties any kind of ideal type of association to which it would seek to mould the agreements that it's asked to interpret. In the case of the EU's development cooperation competence, we can see the court being guided in developing, the, in, in developing its ideas of the scope of that competence by um, policy documents that are for not from the, not the, not the treaty itself, but policy documents such as the European Consensus on Development, as well as secondary legislation. Um, Broberg and Holgaard have commented, the real benchmark for determining the scope of the Union's development cooperation policy appears to be derived not from Articles 208 and 209 TFEU, but from the European Consensus and the Development Cooperation Instrument. Perhaps even more striking since it involves the CFSP and the boundary between the CFSP and other external powers, while not such a gulf as prior to the Lisbon Treaty, is still significant. In addressing a challenge by the European Parliament to the choice of procedure for concluding an agreement with Mauritius on the transfer and trial of suspected pirates, the court simply goes along with the Parliament's acceptance of a of a, that a CFSP legal basis was appropriate in substantive terms. The court argues the case on purely procedural grounds and unlike the Advocate General in the case does not address at all the institution's choice of substantive legal basis. Of course it's true that neither party sought to contest that substantive legal basis so it didn't need to discuss it. But since the court was to hold that the procedural legal basis, which they did contest, should follow the substantive legal basis, this would have given it a ground on which to critique the choice if it had chosen to do so. So I'm going to move on to the concept of structural principles now. And, and what, I, what I'm seeking to argue um, in, this, in this next um, part of the lecture is that, um, to summarise it perhaps, whereas in its internal policies the Union is instructed to, const to construct something, in other words, an internal market, an area of freedom, security and justice. In its external policy the Union is called upon to construct itself, to build its actiness and its agency and I think that's what's behind the process that I'm, I'm describing. I think that if we turn to the institutional structures of EU external policy making, we see the law being used through structural principles to construct the union as an autonomous international actor. So the fact that the EU is a rule-based actor the fact that it operates through law, that its powers are derived from law, is strongly evident. When we examine the external relations of the EU, we find the law is central, and the contributions made by the court have been crucial. Given its unwillingness, which I've just been discussing, to interfere with the institution's policy agenda setting, how is it doing this? So my argument is that the court, through an interlocking set of structural principles, is establishing a framework expressed in or implied from the treaties, which protects the in, an institutional space within which policy may be formed and in which the different actors understand and work within their respective roles. <coughs>
These principles regulate the relationships between the different actors in the complex <coughs> EU system, which includes not only the EU institutions themselves, but also the member states and indirectly <coughs> individuals and third countries, so as to enable the creation of an EU actiness. So these are principles which are not concerned with the substantive content of policy, but rather with process and the relationships between the actors in those processes, and their normative content reflects this. What does it mean to say that these are principles, first of all? Well, princi these principles are legal norms. They have a legal function. Breach of them may result in the illegality of the resulting measure. But a principle is, as we know, a different type of norm from a rule. A rule is designed to operate in and to govern a specific set of circumstances. A principle has a more fundamental character. We may say that rules flow from and should be consistent with underlying principles. The court ranks general principles at the level of primary law in the hierarchy of EU norms. So a principle is somehow fundamental, justifying and underpinning the specificity and the detail of rules, both procedural and substantive. How do they interact with rules, these principles, such as the principles I have in mind, such as the duty of sincere cooperation, or the principle of transparency? How do they operate in relation to, for example, the rules applicable to the negotiation and conclusion of treaties? Clearly, they can be translated into specific rules, for example, into an interinstitutional agreement. But the fundamental nature of these principles and their generality, as opposed to the specificity of rules, means that principles will inform and guide the interpretation of rules, even where they have not been adopted to give them specific expression. So, for example, in the CITES case, Commission and Council 370 of 07, the court based its ruling on the principles of legal certainty and conferral, dismissing somewhat cursorily the party's terminological arguments, as it called them, that were relying on different linguistic versions of what's now Article 218, Paragraph 9, and concluding, the court concluding, that in principle, any measure producing binding effects is subject to the obligation to state reasons. <coughs> principles, unlike rules, are not designed to give an answer in a specific case. A principle will instead point to a particular direction of argument or line of reasoning. And one, characteristic, one result of this characteristic is that they may be held in tension with one another without being seen as contradictory or conflicting they may legitimately pull in different directions. Let's take an example from a recent judgment, which I think is a strong example since one of the principles is conferral, which if any might have a claim to be considered especially fundamental. In the OIV case, Germany against Council, it's 399 of 12, Germany contested the use of Article 218, Paragraph 9, TFEU for the adoption of a council decision determining the position to be adopted by the member states in the context of an international agreement to which the EU is not a party. Article 218, paragraph 9 covers council's decisions, quotes, establishing the positions to be adopted on the union's behalf in a body set up by an agreement when that body is called upon to adopt acts having legal effects. Germany's argument, based on was explicitly based on the principle of conferral, was that this provision applies to agreements concluded by the European Union and cannot be extended to agreements concluded by the member states. The court rejected the argument. It did not, of course, deny the principle of conferral. It simply found that it was not contravened in the case. And it did so by giving an interpretation of paragraph 9 that, while textual, was fundamentally influenced by the principle of effectiveness. The argument being that in cases where the EU cannot be a party to an agreement, but which nevertheless falls within EU competences, the EU may exercise that competence through its member states, acting on its behalf and in its interest. And in the court's view, there was nothing in the wording of paragraph 9 which prevented it from being used for that purpose in this case. What does it mean to say that these prin principles are structural? What do I mean when I say that they're structural? I think structural principles can be seen as a type 
of general principles. Some of the principles that I've identified as structural are usually included in lists of general principles, effectiveness, transparency, the rule of law, perhaps, as well. Others, however, are not, including conferral, sincere cooperation, autonomy. I'm not convinced that we gain much from attempting to ascertain whether there is a canon of general principles and that a structural principle somehow gains greater weight by having been also characterised as a general principle. It could also be argued, and Tridimas makes this point when he writes on general principles, that the value of classifying, trying to classify general principles, is limited. So in that case, why am I seeking to argue that there is this category of structural principles? Does it really increase our understanding of EU external relations law? Well, I, I would want to say that it does, in that it helps us to make sense of the phenomenon that I identified in the first part of the lecture, and the very particular role played by the legal norms that I'm categorising as structural principles in shaping the decision and the policy-making processes of EU external relations. The contribution to the policy-making of each actor, including member states as well as institutions, and the balance and the constructive relationships between them, their accountability to individuals and third countries affected by their decisions, and the transparency that underpins that accountability. And I think their role is important precisely because the substantive content of that policy is left so undefined by EU treaty law. So, by structural, I mean, first of all, that there's, these principles are structural in the sense of defining and being inherent in, to the deep structure of the EU. They have a specific function this is an, which is both internal and external in effect. Internal in the sense of structuring internal processes, how decisions are made. External in the sense that the legal particularities of the EU as an international actor, for example, the joint participation of the EU and member states in mixed agreements, or the way in which EU law determines the status of international law within the EU legal system, find their sources in these principles. They're structural in the sense of being concerned with the process of policy making rather than its content. In this sense, they can be distinguished from the objective-oriented principles, uh, which we find in Article 21.1 TEU, and which reflect the Union's foundational values as expressed in Article 2. What does it mean to say that these are structural principles of external relations law? There are two dimensions to this question which I think are interrelated. The first is simple to state, but it's not simple to answer. All the principles which I would categorise as structural principles also operate in the context of internal action. Do they operate differently when the action is external, and if so, how? We might argue that all principles, by their nature as principles, operate in their particular context. And the external context is simply a manifestation of that inherent contextual operation of principles. So, on that view, there's nothing special about structural principles operating in external relations, although the sectoral context will have an impact. But there is another dimension. What if the structure takes a different shape in the case of internal and external action? Structural principles in the internal context may be concerned primarily with the structure that it is the Union's mission to build, that is, its construction of an area of freedom, security and justice, of an internal market, of an economic and monetary union. Thus, the unity of the market may be an important structural principle for the European Union. So also might be the internal space within which freedom of movement may take place, or the mutual trust between courts and between member state authorities, which is at the heart of the area of freedom, security and justice, the internal market, and indeed in theory of the EMU. In the external context, in contrast, insofar as the EU has a mission to construct, it is to construct the EU itself as an effective external actor. Thus, for example, unity becomes a question of the unity of the international representation of the Union and its member states. It's given the task, as we've seen, to build partnerships and relations with third countries in order to pursue certain broad objectives. So structural principles should provide a solid foundation for the construction 
of the EU as an international actor, as a treaty maker, a participant in international negotiations. They're concerned with the articulation of power of the EU's constituent parts, as I said before, including the member states. They're concerned with the ability of the EU both to establish a distinct identity as a global actor and to project the policies it's developed and with its need to operate within a system of international law. And it's this dimension, I think, which turns these principles from being simply institutional principles to being structural in nature. So I'd like now in uh, a few, the few remaining minutes to offer a tentative typology of structural principles. And I'm, um, I think it's helpful to identify two types of function and two types of structural principle the ones that I would call relational and the ones that I would call systemic. Relational principles govern the relationships between actors, between legal subjects, not the relations between norms. So the structure here refers to the framework within which the actors in the EU system of external relations can play their roles, deciding and implementing policy. In its recent opinion 213, on the proposed accession of the EU to the European Convention on Human Rights, the Court of Justice refers to the specific characteristics of the Union and, and EU law, which include, quotes, those relating to the constitutional structure of the European Union, which is seen in the principle of conferral of powers and in the institutional framework established in Articles 13 to 19 TEU. These essential characteristics, the court says, have given rise to a structured network of principles, rules and mutually interdependent legal relations linking the EU and its member states and its member states with each other. So the, the, this is what I have in mind when I talk about relational principles. Uh, and then the second uh, category are the pr principles that I would call systemic and these are the principles which are concerned with the outcomes of those processes, or perhaps better, with the building of the EU's identity as an international actor. And they are the principles of coherence, of effectiveness, and autonomy. And they make it clear that structural principles are not simply concerned to define static relations between actors, but are designed to guide their conduct and to ensure that the actors do, in fact, act. Um, so, in terms of relational principles, I think we can define um, four different relational axes, you might call them, and each of these is governed by one or more structural principles, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to go into um, the detail here, but just to outline uh, the, my theory on this. So the first of the axes would be the member state, member state relationship. And here we have principles of mutual solidarity and, uh, and cooperation. We have the member state institutional relationship, which is governed by the principle of conferral, certainly, and the principle of sincere cooperation. Um, just to... to to make, say, one note really about the principle of conferral as it applies to the member state institutional relationship. It's a, it, it has a centrality, of course, but on the other hand, there have been very few cases where it has been found that the union has no competence at all. So we could argue that this is prin a principle which in practice, at least, is not so important as a power-limiting principle but more because it makes clear the role of law and therefore the courts in structuring EU external power. It's an underlying principle which establishes the need for a legal structure to EU power. And I think in, it's in that sense that it's very um, fundamental. Um, the member state institutional relationship is also governed by the principle of subsidiarity. And... Um, I want to say a little word about that because subsidiarity and external relations is something that I find very hard to think about. It's difficult to see how the principle of subsidiarity applies in the context of external relations. It's not very clear. Um, 
Maybe um, one could look at two aspects to this question. First of all, subsidiarity generally refers to the choice between EU or member state action against a background of shared competence um, in the context of preemption, Article 2.2 TFEU. In external relations, this, this choice does of course exist, uh, should the Union Act or should the Member States Act, but in external relations is characterised by the fact that the EU and Member States often operate side by side. So I think we could indeed perhaps see even the use of mixed agreements as an expression of subsidiarity. And in the case of so-called parallel competences, such as development cooperation or humanitarian aid, it is explicitly stated that the exercise of union competence shall not result in the member states being prevented from exercising theirs. So the choice for union action will affect, but does not necessarily preclude, member state action. And that must affect how sub subsidiarity operates. So my second point would be that in the external context, the choice between EU and member state action does not in fact um, imply a choice between different levels of action, uh, national or union, in the classic context of subsidiarity, since both the, the EU and the member states would act internationally. So if we're to maintain the idea, which seems to be one of the underlying, or underlying the conception of some subsidiarity, the idea of a choice of level of action, acting as closely as possible to the citizen, then we may consider subsidiarity perhaps as referring to the choice between acting at union level and acting internationally or at global level. And in this sense, you could even see implied external powers as an expression of the principle of subsidiarity based on the decision to act at the most appropriate level to achieve the union's objectives, the appropriate level in that case being the international one. So that's the member state um, institution relationship. Then we have the principles that are concerned with inter-institutional relations, including in particular institutional balance and sincere cooperation. And here there's been a, um, the Lisbon Treaty by articulating in Article 13.2 of the TEU these principles of um, conferral of powers um, and uh, sincere cooperation um, has, has in a way given a gift to the institutions uh, which they're using in litigation. Uh, increasingly we're seeing um, claims based on failures of sincere cooperation or overstepping conferral of powers, um, undermining institutional balance in, uh, in inter-institutional disputes. Um, I think we can also see some institutional principles in, involving the relationship between the EU institutions and individuals or third countries, and they would include um, the rule of law and transparency, but I'm not going to say any more about that. Um, so, in conclusion then, I've, I've introduced this concept of structural principles by putting forward a preliminary assessment of their rationale, their nature, their function. We started from an observation about the character of external relations competences, the task of the union guided by its values to develop relations and build partnerships with third countries and international organizations, the objectives established in the treaties for the union's external policy are orientational and general rather than functional, this is not to downplay their importance, but rather to understand the nature of their role. Policy goals certainly exist, but they're created as a result of policy making by the union's institutional framework, giving concrete shape to the union's objectives in specific situations or on particular issues. I then argued that this characteristic of EU external competence shapes the role of law in external relations. Its, its focus is not on shaping the uses to which the union's powers are put, but rather on shaping or constructing an institutional space within which policy can be made. 
The legal structure thus created is protective of the policy autonomy of the union, of the powers of the different actors in the system, and has developed principles which govern their relations. And I've termed these principles structural because they help to define the structure of the EU as an international actor, both internally and externally. As structural principles, they're concerned with process rather than content. And I've identified these two types, relational and systemic. The relational principles concerning the existence and exercise of competence, solidarity, cooperation, transparency, observance of the rule of law. Systemic principles being concerned with the solidity of the structure, the building of the EU as a coherent, effective and autonomous actor. And I'm, I hope that this attempt to look at EU external relations through the lens of structural principles will help us to understand better the role that the law plays in this construction project. Thank you. kind of lecture which is which full of uh, insights that make plagiarism almost irresistible. <laughs> um, the one, two that I particularly liked was the idea of an interlocking set of principles creating an institutional space within which policy can be formed. Um, that really, I think, describes what happens almost perfectly. Um, I also very much like your reference to the role um, of, of the, the union in, in external relations being to construct itself as an effective international actor, which seems to me also to um, hit the spot exactly. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, can I invite questions and comments? I always say on these occasions, your intervention doesn't need to end on a rising inflection. <laughs> comments are just as welcome as questions. So over to you. I'm afraid I don't know you all, so it would be nice if you would identify yourselves when you Ask a question. Yes, Joe, I do know you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Joanne Scott and I'm a professor of European Law at UCL. Thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. So the, the language of the structure of the No, I think that's, that's a great question. I mean, it, I, I do think that it's in the nature of principles to, they have a flexibility about them actually. I mean, the structural business does make them sound very kind of immo immovable maybe, but in practice, they have changed. If you think of the, the principle of, of conferral, in the, at the time of AETR, the court took the view that uh, if you give the power to the community, as it then was, you take it away from the member states, that it's either or. Um, and that, that changed over time, but it, it's changed quite dramatically. And, and now we, we're quite accepting of the idea and many of the principles which have been developed more recently, uh, which have come to the fore more recently, such as sincere cooperation, um, have, have actually been a response to the idea that the member states and the union operate side by side and, and you need to manage that. So I think we, we've seen, we see there the court, um, or, or at least the law, uh, at the court behind that, adapting its ideas. Um, that's, that's just one example. I, I think you're right about autonomy. I think the court is still, 
in a way that's quite a young principle, I would say, and it's, it's something which I think the court is still, it, it's, it's having to hold, hold several things in tension. And it, it, the, the, I think that's in the nature of these principles. And I think that's something that, that I would like to, to work on a little bit more, is, is exactly how it manages to hold. What, what exactly is it holding in tension? Um, the identity of the union as against the fact that its, um, its identity is, is, is in fact defined by its relations with the outside world. So you, you've got that tension there or, already. Um, and I, I, I think, I, I, th I, I think perhaps part of the problem, uh, one of the reasons why we, we feel perhaps frustrated or, and, and, and why we see this tension which hasn't yet been resolved, I think, is precisely the fact that the, the court is not engaging in the substantive policy um, argument. So it's not taking a position on the substantive policy choice. And, and, and that, because in a way, if it did, it would, be, it would be easier. I mean, that was a bit the frustration that people had with Cuddy, wasn't it? I mean, that uh, the court was, on the one hand, saying, you know, we, 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 see, the, we see this objective, um, but we're not going to give an interpretation which, which furthers that objective. We're going to give an interpretation which, um, which fits our view of the, what I would call the constitutional structure of the union. So I think in a way the, the fact that the court is refusing to engage in the substantive debate on policy um, is, is perhaps one reason why it, 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 you have this, this sense of it having to hold different different ideas, it, different conceptions, different principles in in an um, unresolved tension. But I, that's just some thoughts on you. Very nice comment, thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, please, sorry. Hello, hello. Um, I was just wondering if you <laughs> That's a really good question too. So the question was, is the EU effective? I mean, I, I, I said, I, I, it, I identified the principle of effectiveness as, a, as, a, as one of these structural principles uh, and one of the systemic ones in that it's, a, it's the ambition of the EU to be effective, let's put it that way. I, and actually, as I was reading through my lecture th this morning, I, I thought... This all sounds too positive. It, doesn't, it sounds too idealistic. Um, it's talking about the EU as effective and coherent and all these things, and actually, of course, we know that it isn't um, in practice. So, uh, you know, I see, I see your point on that. But I think, so I, I think my point is really, um, if we're thinking about... Okay, so I'll, I'll put in a nutshell what I feel about that. There's only so much that law can do. Okay, so the and that's what I mean by making by this institutional policy space. So the space is there, and the job of the law is to create it. But how it's used and how effectively it's used is is a different matter altogether. And of course, one can be very frustrated and and um, indeed critical of of the way that those that, of those that the way that those powers are being used. But I, I think what I'm, what I'm interested in is the way in which we, we talk in the context of international relations, we talk a lot about power. It's power that matters, it's power that's important. And so that immediately gives you rise to the question, how does law relate to power? And that in a way is, a, is what, I'm, what I'm trying to talk about. But I, how the power is used and how effective the EU really is, of course, is in the end, the, the million dollar question, which is, is uh, in a way, mm, I don't think, it's not easy for me to answer that question. It's empirical uh, and it's not this kind of, of um, uh, it's not, I'm not going to get the answer to that question through this kind of exercise, which says something about the nature, nature of the exercise, I guess. Can't we, yeah. just to follow up on that, Mm. Can't we say that in some areas the union is very effective? Um, 
trade, for example, mm -hmm. um, development cooperation, um, the external dimension of the single market, which of course is trade, but more than, more than trade. that. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, I'm sure, thanks to the development of these principles, which has helped mm -hmm. um, the, the, the union to really act, to, to become a, 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 a respected international actor. Mm. Well, I was going to ask you about what we call the AETR principle. Mm -hmm. That um, if the EU is acted internally, um, it has e exclusive power to act externally. Would you? Would that be a principle in your sense, or or something else? I've I've wondered about that. I I I haven't included that in my in my conception of the structural principles because I think in the end it's it's about the principle of conferral. Um, but I, yeah, I, 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 I guess you, you probably could um, put forward an argument. But it's, it's okay, I think it's, it's uh, the principle of conferral, perhaps, together with conceptions of coherence, because I think it's essentially about pre preemption is really about coherence. It's about ensuring that the internal and the external work work together. It's ensuring that the member states don't go off and act externally in such a way as to compromise the effectiveness of and the coherence of the union's in, in, internal policy choices. Um, and it's, I, I think it's interesting uh, in the way that it privileges well, this is a slightly daring way of putting it, but I'll say it anyway, that it privileges the internal over the external. If you, in, the se in this sense, that it privileges uh, the, the internal polic policies of the union. Um, so quite a lot of EU external relations law is actually about the internal policy, and it, isn't it? It's about trying to ensure that those policies are protected, that they're not jeopardized, um, that they are... Uh, 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 carried on, carried out um, effectively through, if necessary, using uh, complementary external um, action. Um, and so, in a way, perhaps it's a reflection of the um, the the Erta principle. Is in a sense could be seen as a reflection of the idea that the treaty is explicit about the internal policy, the substantive policy objectives of the union, um, these things that the union is supposed to be building, um, whereas it isn't in the external context. And the, I think there's a link there. Mm. Mm. Yes, please. Um, so mm. Alex Mills, also from the Faculty of Law here. Um, can I say a follow-up on that, I guess? Mm. Um, with something that, that I guess puzzled me a little bit, and, and I may just be showing my ignorance of the EU law here, but it felt to me that if you were dealing with an area that, that uh, was within kind of ERTA, um, kind of implied um, powers, um, that there ought to be some link between the policy direction of the exercise of that external power and the internal policy which has given rise to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and wouldn't that be a legal principle which would provide yes. some kind of substantive policy content to the exercise oh, of yes. the external Oh yes. Powers in that way, so that would be an exception to the idea that the EU acting externally is just yes. sort of developing itself as an as an international actor. It's yes, I think I yes, I wouldn't quite call it an exception, but it is a different operate. Yes, I mean, well, here I'm I'm borrowing really from from Alan on this, right? Because I think in this context, in in a sense, we're not talking about external powers. We're talking about a competence to engage in. Uh, let's say the building of the internal market, um, and the 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 realization, if you like, that in order to do that, we need to be able to to act externally as well as by adopting regulations and directives. So, in a, in a sense, um, this is about um, it's an external dimension of something that's that's internal rather than, do you see what I'm saying? So this is why I gave the example of the opinion 194 on the WTO, because the court is very definitely saying there 
You can't say that because the union can act, um, can have, has power internally in services, that it can just go off and do services out there. Uh, you can only uh, engage in, at that time, different now, you can only engage in, in um, external relations in relation to services if you can prove that it serves the purpose of the internal market. And in this case, it didn't. Um, so it, it, so I'm, I would want to make a distinction rather than an exception and say that what we're really talking about here is a, 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 a competence to achieve a particular result, yes, um, which gives rise to actions at different levels internal and external. Um, and that is, it seems to me, a different uh, structural relationship than the external powers in the sense of trade policy, com co um, uh, development cooperation, common foreign security policy, and so on. Yes, please. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Angelos, that's a really tricky one. I think you have to give me, I have to think that through. Maybe uh, you think about autonomy? Because I, I, I was suggesting autonomy would be a, a, a systemic principle. What I, what I think what I, what I mean by that is it's not concerned with how the different actors in the system operate, to, but it's uh, concerned with um, the nature of the system. In a way, what I'm feeling towards, but I'm, I mean, I think it, it, I'm, still, I'm still struggling a bit with autonomy. It's, it's, it's about the way in which the union um, handles the fact that it's a creature of international law and that it, 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 it's, um, if it's going to be an effective actor, it has to act through international law. But at the same time, it has to hold itself as, as somehow... Uh, distinct from, it's not simply a, um, in the view of the court at any rate, it's not simply a, um, a treaty between, between a, a group of treaty party, parties, that, it's, that it, it has something separate about it. So and this is something very elusive, um, but this is what I had in mind by systemic. But what do you mean by you're, you're, you're saying that it might operate internally as more as a relational principle. No, I mean externally as a relational. Oh, externally as a relational. In the sense that it's yeah. dealing with the relationship between, yeah. Could be. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think eager session to be seen which are both having an, an, an effect on autonomy, or at some point it seems that regardless of either sitting to be seen, it would still be a problem of great autonomy because mm. member states are. No, no, I, I see your point. I see your point. That's interesting. I'd have to think about that. I'd, I'd, I'd think, I was thinking about it as more about the relationship between different systems, right? But. Um, I think that you can think about it in the way you're suggesting as well, certainly. That's good. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, Mary, thank you very much indeed for dealing with the rather tricky questions. Good questions. Um, <laughs> good, but not easy. Um, so, so clearly, so fully. Um, there's lots more to discuss, um, but we can do it pleasantly with a glass. <laughs> so I invite you once more to express our collective thanks to Professor Tomat.